Good morning. That was fantastic. And um, really appreciate all the advice, especially as an academician who's venturing out into this world for the first time. Um, and I'm excited to hear that we should do as much as we can at the university beforehand. And so what I'm going to share with you, uh, all generated from work we did at the University of Mississippi in my lab in collaboration with uh, imaging group at Stanford. Um, and we are now in the process of forming our company, Painbox, which will allow us to use a pain diagnostic pet imaging tracer to guide treatment for um, chronic pain. So the standard of care and imaging today is really fueling the pain epidemic. There are about 50 million people that are suffering with chronic pain in the United States, and 17 million of those have really debilitating pain. In other words, they're not even able to function, um, go to work, get out of bed in, in some of those cases as well. About 50% of these patients fail uh, to benefit from current treatments. And about 80% of them end up returning for repeat, repeat procedures and hospitalizations. The cost of pain management is probably greater than $350 billion a year, but this is estimated based on lost workdays and cost of the healthcare system. Uh, obviously, there's very poor diagnostics available right now, and there's the scale of 0 to 10 in terms of how you feel about your pain. Uh, this is subjective and not objective. And what we bring to the table is a way to objectify pain through a combination of imaging and artificial intelligence. And so what we're looking at here is a potential billion dollar diagnostic opportunity. So inaccurate diagnosis is the leading cause of ineffective treatment. And what you can see here is that individuals with knee pain, um, about 63% of them will have meniscal tears. And those that are asymptomatic, we still have 61% diagnosed with meniscal tears. So this is interesting because one is in pain and one isn't. So how do we accurately go about treating these individuals? And current pain treatments are only about 30% effective. And so we have dose limiting issues with opioids, we have opioid crisis, um, and then we have interventions that simply aren't working from a surgical perspective or a nerve ablation perspective. So what we've uh, developed is really what we consider a breakthrough for pain management. Um, <clears throat> and the limitations of the current pain diagnostics or the standard of care uh, is really that morphology has low selectivity and sensitivity. Uh, subjective pain measurement, as I mentioned with the scale. Uh, so many times uh, individuals will tell you an area that's in pain and they cannot detect or pinpoint exactly where that pain is originating from. All of this leads to poor management of that pain and has led us to the pain crisis, um, which we've all sort of lived through and heard about as the opioid crisis, but really it's a pain crisis that's driving that process. Um, trial and error treatments are sort of common as well, and many are shots in the dark. A lot of this leads to just a capitulation and telling patients, you know, sorry, this is the best we can do. You're going to have to deal with this and live with it. Uh, unfortunately, that leads to despair, and uh, unfortunately for us, congressional directives for funding uh, new avenues around pain. Our diagnostic opportunity really has a high sensitivity and specificity to tag a pain biomarker at the site of nerve damage. It's quantifiable, so this is where the AI piece comes in, so we can actually start to look at the quantification of pain state. Um, across specific populations and treatments. It's precision management to aid in the pain crisis. So we actually have cases where we've taken individuals that have had years, a decade of chronic pain on a 10 to 10 daily basis scale, cured them down to zero out of 10. And this is pretty remarkable considering that um, you know, when I got into this job as a pharmacist originally and then went for a PhD, it's all about the patients at the end of the day and really seeing an impact early on in our clinical trials is is just something I, I, I get very emotional about. So this is just awesome. Um, we've been able to eliminate treatments for individuals. We've been able to really improve standard of care for these individuals because we can direct treatment. And now we can confidently assess and address pain now. Uh, 
And so I'm going to share a couple case studies with you. Um, one that I mentioned where we um, were able to help cure this woman of her pain, a 54-year-old with chronic knee pain um, who actually couldn't sit or stand without severe pain, couldn't walk on grass barefooted, couldn't walk downhill or downstairs. Uh, her pain was not easily localized, and she had several surgeries, several uh, MRI exams. Nothing could determine what was happening. Uh, she was sort of at the wit's end, and she came to our trial. And what you can see on the image here on the, on the right is uh, our diagnostic lighting up a specific anatomical area in the knee. Um, and what happened as a result of this, and that's our pet tracer up there, very small molecule, uh, fluorine tagged, F18 tagged molecule that can be injected and the patient can go into a pet MR. And this was a case, a lucky case for us of being in the right place at the right time. Um, GE Health Sciences put in the first ever uh, multimodal PET MR instrument into Stanford and funded several trials. And we were one of the ones that was selected for funding. And the basis of that was to get images so that they could sell more instruments. And they've been very successful at that. Um, <laughs> so this was our this was our case. Uh, to make a long story short, since the physician, the treating physician was able to identify where this exact location was, they were able to go in arthroscopically um, and really clean up the area. And this patient was completely pain free and in 18 months had restored all uh, muscular um, that was atrophied and, and is doing excellent today with no pain. Uh, this is published as a case report in Journal of Pain Research. We have another example, uh, and this one is striking because oftentimes we don't get to do a post image after a treatment is done. Um, this individual had a meniscal tear repair uh, and an MCL uh, repair as well. After that surgery, nine months later, they were still in severe pain uh, in the knee, and the physician that performed the surgery refused to redo a surgery and said, it's all in your head. Um, so this individual came to our trial and we were able to see at the top panel there, you can see very much in what's called the Hoffa's pad uh, is, is uptaking the agent. Um, and this was uh, another physician came along and was able to clean that area up. And nine months later, you can see on the rescan, there's no uh, indication of damage. This looks normal. Uh, and the pain is completely gone for this patient. So this is great if we can have a surgical intervention. And I'll explain the mechanism here uh, quickly for you as, as to what's going on. But what we've also done in many of these cases is identified a specific area of pain or a location of pain in the periphery where we could do ultrasound guided injection of bupivacaine and um, dexamethasone. Uh, that can last for three to four months for pain relief in these patients. And so we've, we've scanned a total of uh, 200 individuals, 100 of those, uh, sorry, <laughs> 10 of those were healthy volunteers at the beginning. 190 of those have all been at sort of the wits end, uh, at, at the end of all options. We have made an impact in 98% of those patients uh, and 75% of those patients have had a change in their uh, delivery of care. 40 of those patients um, had interventions, surgical interventions done, 39% or 39 of those have uh, significantly improved to no pain or very mild pain remaining. So we're very excited about where we are with this. Um, this compound actually targets sigma-1 receptors. Sigma-1 receptors were uh, long thought to be opioid receptors, but uh, they're a very unique protein, and these are overexpressed in pain. Uh, and so what they do is they move from intracellular stores up to the cell surface, and they interact with proteins, um, and they're overexpressed in a painful inflammatory state. And so we can target that specifically to the, to the injured tissue. We've done a lot of free clinical development, all to tell you that we've looked at all the species, and obviously we're in humans. Uh, we have a good stable, high yield radio synthetic scheme uh, that we can use. It has to be used at this point at point of care. Um, we can detect all of this pain in a model of chronic pain. So this is what led us to the human trials where we actually took an animal model that's a chronic pain animal model called the spared nerve injury model. 
we knew exactly where we injured the animal's nerve and we were able to see uh, how we could clean that and, and treat that animal. So this is kind of where we are right now. We've, we've uh, exclusively obtained the license from the University of Mississippi and Stanford to work on this forward. We've gotten costs down to about $2,000 a scan, um, which is a huge saving if you can intervene and treat that patient right away. The U.S., as I mentioned before, has about 17 million patients with debilitating pain, 80% 80, 80 of these with indeterminate causes. Um, we feel that we can serve immediately 100,000 to a million patients uh, and probably double that if we go worldwide. Uh, and so we're now seeking partners and investors. Uh, and just to show you our team, uh, we've had very little adverse events and we've had no severe events. Uh, I'm the founding advisor for the company uh, with 25 years in medicinal chemistry experience and pain specifically treatments. Um, Dave uh, Singhal is here with us. Uh, he's 25 years in imaging and AI and has sold two companies before. Deepak Bayera is on also uh, on the patents with me and managed a lot of the early trials uh, at Stanford. And then Peter Webner is uh, expert in nuclear medicine and is right now the CEO of Spectron RX uh, and helping in radio, in radio pharmaceutical advisement. So thank you.